But one thing about the war is that at some point, whether you were a soldier or a civilian, we were all victims of the same circumstance. The rebels fought for so long that they forgot why they were fighting. Some of them had never even met the rebel leaders. They were instructed to kill. And that's what they were doing. Some for revenge, because their own parents had been killed in the same civil wars. Some because with an AK-47, you at least had an authoritative mandate above the other people in the community. At least if civilians have food that you want, with your AK-47, you will actually take it. I approach this um, from two positions. One is a sense of obligation to my country, Sierra Leone, and uh, a sense of citizenship to the world. If you have studied colonial history, you often hear the phrase uh, in colonial literature, when uh, England sneezes, the colonies catch the cold. The world has become a little bit larger than that now. Nowadays, that phrase is not dependent on an empire. Nowadays, even if a country as small as Kiribati sneezes, the rest of the world catches the cold. Um, I need not emphasize that because you're all at Vermont Law School and you've already realized that issues of climate change, for instance, do not only affect one region spread throughout our environment, um, the global system in which we live. But more importantly, civil wars and political insurrections, the attack of one nation by another, affect us all. I live in Liberia in 1989 when the country was invaded by Charles Taylor. If you're interested in international law, you have heard about Charles Taylor. He's currently at the Hague and his case is pending. Um, but in 1989, Charles Taylor invaded Liberia in order to replace the ruling government of Samuel Kaindo at the time. He formed a rebel group known as the NPFL, the National Patriotic Front of Liberia. Uh, their aim was to overthrow the government of Samuel Doe and uh, re-establish a new system of governance. There were some legitimate reasons for this. Um, the country was unstable. Um, it was being governed through tribalism, nepotism. Food prices were going up. And he was basically, at his own discretion, killing people. So when Charles Taylor started his movement from the United States, he was in prison in Boston for embezzlement. Uh, he had a lot of support until he got to Liberia and s suddenly started doing most of what Samuel Doe had been doing in Liberia and even more. Uh, the president of Liberia today is Ellen Johnson Sullivan. Ellen Johnson Sullivan was a supporter of Charles Taylor when the rebellion started. But when he started to recruit children, kill innocent civilians, the mission changed and Ellen Johnson suddenly stopped supporting him. And then in 1990, my father, who was a professor in Sierra Leone, and the rest of the other West African communities were arrested by Charles Taylor's National Patriotic Front of Liberia. Because during the Civil War, the MPFL, which was a rebel movement, refused to negotiate properly with peacekeepers. So ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, has a peacekeeping force known as ECOMOG. ECOMOG decided to intervene in Liberia. But the closest airport to Liberia, Monrovia, is Freetown, Sierra Leone. So because the fighter jets were leaving Freetown and 
bombarded in Liberia, Chancellor decided to arrest and incarcerate all West Africans living in Liberia. And so every West African, Ghanaians, Nigerians, and so on and so forth. But even out of the greatest horrors, um, sometimes we see enormous good. Um, think of the lives of your heroes. You will realize that most of them are born out of enormous struggles. Um, and sometimes why we may want to avert suffering altogether, we can never really understand the goodness of life unless we've seen roughness of life. Uh, many people ask me today, why are you always so happy? And I say, I have seen the worst of life and I have lived with the Norwegians. Uh, <laughs> you begin to understand humanity in a different sense because the stories I'm going to tell you will involve people committing horrendous crimes. But even in the midst of that, you realize snippets of the actual nature of humans. We are not evil creatures. We are, in fact, if there's anything made about us, it's goodness. Uh, to the contrary, there are lots of evil in the world today. And that can simply lead us to recline and become extremely hopeless to the other goodness of the world. And we refuse to become participants. To put it in the form of communication, people always say, I never receive any emails. And I say, well, how many have you written? You do not get letters unless you've written one. You cannot call for world peace when you do not even say hello to your neighbor. So we all have to become participants in the creation of the kind of world that we dream of. In my first night in prison, as a child, there was a man who's probably been bitten seriously and he was crying so painfully. I've never heard anyone cry like that in my life. Cried all night. Now, this is an African society in which a man is not supposed to cry. And you enter a prison as a child, growing up in this society, and an entire night, a grown man is weeping like a child. I could not sleep until he stopped crying. And that's when he died. And that was the first time I came vis-a-vis -vis there. I had not even started living my own life. And I suddenly realized what the difference between life and death is. And not only that, that one can go through such painful means. Because before then, I had experienced death. But in African society, we sing and dance even at funerals. So death was never the same again after that experience. This is the first time I also encountered child soldiers. Um, children who were a little bit older than me, carrying AK-47s, talking about how many people they have killed in your life. Um, I still do not understand why I was never recruited. Uh, but maybe that wasn't part of their mandate. They kept us there so that we could die one by one under their view. Um, another story is the story of an old man, probably in his 80s. He spent his entire life in Samuel Doe's army, the National Army of Liberia. He worked in the ammunition depot. All he knew how to do was to mantle and dismantle guns. He knew nothing about the politics of the country, nothing about the functioning of defense. He too was captured by the rebels. But the rebels insisted that he had some information from the government of Liberia, which he must reveal. So every morning they will beat him with gun butts uh, in order to suppress information from him. And he would repeat the same thing, which I now remember. I know nothing, my children. And this is the first time in my life that I've seen a man is bitten so much they beat him so much that he cried to the point that he could no longer cry. And they would do that morning, afternoon, and evening. And he would repeat the same thing. I know nothing, my children. Um, all I know is 
is how to mantle and dismantle guns. But he could never convince them. That old man, his name was Gawi Zeze. His life, even in my childhood, has stayed with me. While we were in prison, the rebels were already telling me when I hung out with them that there is no need for us to be so worried about going back to Sierra Leone because in fact they now have a mission to go to Sierra Leone. Uh, so it was useless and futile to be insisting on going back to a country that is going to be attacked anyway. Um, but uh, we got our freedom in 1991, March, after serious negotiation and probably some ransom. Everything in Liberia had been destroyed at that time. No cars, nothing. Houses were burned down. So many people had been killed. Um, you walk through the streets, it's like you're walking through the graveyards. Almost like an apocalypse. Children with guns, dead bodies, human skulls everywhere. Um, my father decided that in spite of that, we can walk back to Sierra Leone. But at this stage, my parents in Sierra Leone had already been told that I was dead. My father had been killed, and um, I died from hunger and starvation. And as an African family, they had already done all the funeral rites, so we were dead and gone in their mountains. Uh, we walked for weeks, and we finally made it to the east of Sierra Leone, and subsequently to my hometown, Pendembo, which is somewhere around there, in the little corner of Sierra Leone, by the home. And we got to my hometown, and uh, my parents heard that we were in town. And the entire town came to the bus station to meet us. But not because they truly believed that we were alive. There is a tradition in Sierra Leone that when people die far away from home, their ghosts reappear to their families at home. So in fact, they believed that we were ghosts. And whenever I tell this story, I insist that it felt like Pentecost. Jesus yeah. appeared to his disciples, <laughs> and Thomas said, where's that mark? Um, so after a while, I mean, especially because of my silliness, they realized that these can't be ghosts. <laughs> They're too silly to be heavenly creatures. <laughs> so, 